Jennifer Poindexter, Director of Promotion and Education at Missouri Farm Bureau. Today we are in Southeast Missouri with Aaron Reeves. Aaron, uh, thanks for joining us and can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Aaron Reeves. I'm from the Hawkham Kennett area here in Southeast Missouri in Duncan County. Uh, I'm a first generation farmer in my family, but uh, we're in a watermelon field that is part of a fifth generation farm with my father in law. Awesome. So, what kind of made you want to grow watermelon? Uh, so, it, basically, I was raised into it. Uh, like I said, this is my father in law's. Uh, field that we're in right now mm -hmm. and he kind of grew up in it yeah. the first kind of record that we have of our his family farm growing watermelons was in 1935 uh, it, it, it was probably before then but that's the earliest record we have and I can't remember if I was 12 or 13 but that was my first summer pitching watermelons and I've been here every summer since you said pitching watermelons, so could, what, how labor intensive is, is watermelons? So it's probably the most labor intensive crop that is grown in the area. Uh, everything is hand harvested uh, from, from cutting it in the field to packing it to shipping it uh, until it reaches a, a big truck to go over the road. It is all done by hand and that is uh, I think the only crop that is done yeah. other than maybe peaches in the area. So, how, how does the planting process work? So, in the, our planting process is we, we buy the seed from a local distributor and we actually have three greenhouses uh, remotely that we grow them. We grow all of our plants locally. And so, we'll start that in the end of February, 1st of March. And from there, we will grow those to a height of six to eight inches. And that usually takes about a month and a half. And whenever they are ready, we will take those. We're, we grow them in those plastic trays. And we've got, we actually transplant every every melon that we, we do. Every so is all the planting done by hand as well? Yes. So start to finish. Start, start to finish. From, from seed to the grocery store is all hand harvested, hand, hand grown, hand harvested. How broad is your um, output as far as, you know, how far are these watermelons going to consumers? Uh, so we've got some that we ship locally that go literally half a mile from our stand. And we've got some that goes far as uh, Quebec, Canada this year. Oh, wow. So you... Inter international. That's really cool. Can you kind of talk to us a little bit about the, the growing conditions for watermelon? Um, the, the soil they need, the, the water, uh, the sunlight, those kinds of conditions that you look for. Okay, so whenever we're planting our watermelon crop, uh, the first thing is it has to be on sandy soil. Anything that holds water or retains water very well, it, watermelons tend not to grow as well. Mm -hmm. So we have to pick just our, our sandiest soil. And from there, we, we determine where those are. And then from there, we, we kind of plant accordingly. Uh, it, it loves sandy soil. The reason it grows so well here is because it, it does get hot in the summertime and watermelons just love heat. So we, we've kind of seen that some crops um, have irrigation to them. Mm -hmm. um, do you irrigate this field? And, and if you do, how is it irrigated? Yeah, so there's two different ways we can water uh, watermelons. Uh, the first one is with a circle uh, center pivot. It's, it's pretty widely used here. Uh, we tend to not do that we kind of stray away from the course what we like to do is drill wells within the field and we like to drip irrigate which means we're we're laying these on a plastic bed mm -hmm. and then there is a one inch tube underneath underneath the plastic and it is right there at the soil and it's all connected and it's it's literally just dropping water right there to the plant to make it more efficient so the water is going to go straight to the roots yes can you reuse irrigation systems or is it a one-time use only? No, it's a one-time use. Uh, the reason for that is because our water is, it's called hard water. Mm -hmm. It's got a lot of minerals in it and there's a lot of mineral buildup in those tubes. And by the end of the year, they're they're pretty much corroded. And so we have to reapply, uh, we have to buy new uh, drip tape every year. 
What, how long is the growing season on watermelons? So the growing season is typically uh, four months or so. Obviously everything depends on the weather, mm -hmm. but typically it, we, we plant it in March and April, more towards the end of April. And then it'll grow clear up until it, some of these vines just give out on us. Uh, sometimes it could be four months, sometimes it could be five. So I know there's there's probably been kids going to county fairs and they see um, blue ribbon watermelons. Mm -hmm. What's been the largest watermelon that you guys have grown? Without kind of looking back, I, I know for sure last year we had a couple of 120 pound watermelons. Uh, we've probably had some a little bit bigger than that, but that's the that's the last one I remember having was a couple of those. That's a lot of watermelon. <laughs> that, that's a big watermelon to feed a lot of people. So if we kind of look at like the parts of a plant on a watermelon, can you mm -hmm. kind of walk us through um, the root system, um, where the watermelon is really going to grow from and, and that process that that takes. Okay, so the the watermelon, it's, the, the plant itself is like I said, underneath plastic. Mm -hmm. we, we, we lay plastic mulch down and then plant into that. Uh, root system is, is very deep. It, the roots will just grow straight down so they can get as much water as it possibly can. Is that a tap root? Yes, it's got, a, it's got one deep tap root and a lot of fibrous roots mm -hmm. that, that branch out from there. But everything that we really need is above the ground. So yep. uh, I actually got a, a vine here. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a running plant is what they call it. And the, if you plant a watermelon plant, it may grow eight feet out in each direction. It's a very, very large plant. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it puts on runners like this, a, a running vine. Mm -hmm. And from there, uh, try to grab it, but there's a couple of, it'll put on flowers like this at every inner node. Mm -hmm. And from there, we've got male flowers, which, which do not produce fruit, and then we've got female flowers that whenever the two are pollinated together, end up forming uh, various stars of watermelon. And from there, they, they grow larger and larger, and uh, eventually you'll get your, your melons that are this size to 120 pounds. 120 pounds. <laughs> the, they grow in all different shapes, sizes. A lot of it's all just weather dependent. So can, can more than one watermelon grow per vine or is it a yeah. one deal? Yeah, so for every flower you see, every female flower, there, there's a potential for one fruit. Mm -hmm. And typically what we like to do is we like to get seven to eight watermelons per plant is, is our goal. Mm -hmm. and, and we've been very successful in doing that. Good. So you talked about pollination. Um, how important is pollination? For you guys and and how does that pollination take place so the pollination is done like I said, we've got male flowers and female flowers on the same plants mm -hmm. uh, the, the wild thing is, is we've got seedless watermelons that we've got out here scattered along with seed yes the seedless watermelons actually do not produce any kind of viable pollen it, it's infertile to get seedless watermelons to grow, they've got to pollinate or cross-pollinate with the seeded watermelons. The way we do that is part of it's done by air, part of it's done by, you know, stray pests running around and, and knocking pollen off and, and pollinate with the other. But what we like to use is honeybees. Yeah. And we've got one hive out here per acre Typically, we just st strategically place them, and that's how we do the majority of our pollinating. It's really neat. Uh, so you kind of mentioned you the the honeybees pollinate. Um, do you bring those in, or do you guys raise honeybees? How how does that process? Work? Yeah. So right up the road, there's a, a company that is contracted out, and we we tell them how many acres we're going to have, and they grow that many uh, hives of bees for us, mm -hmm. and they'll put them out, and that's. It's kind of a two-fold deal, you know, it's a win-win situation. So you're not receiving the honey from the, from the bees? We may get one jar of it, but we, we still have to pay for it. 
Uh, so can you tell us, um, like, how many acres do you have of, of watermelons and and what kind of, how hard is it to get that those acreages in? So this year we've got almost 320 acres of watermelons, cantaloupes, and honeydews. And that is spread out from, from here in Kennett all the way to the north end of the county in Marble. What we like to do is kind of spread it out just like yeah. that. To spread your risk, obviously. But uh, it, it's, like I said in the beginning, it's a very labor-intensive practice. We have a slew of people that come in and help us. Uh, some some are from the H2A workers, some are local. But it is a it's a 24-hour job while while the melons are getting prepped and ready for transplanting in the ground all the way through the end of harvest. So this is bigger than just a family operation. You're gonna be hiring I, yes, the absolutely. to come in. The scale we're at, it, it does have to be a little bit larger than you know your, your average family coming out here and loading up the truck over melons. So a lot of people are gonna try to grow watermelons at home in their garden and, and they may get five, six watermelons yeah. a year. Um, what is what, some of the challenges you face being on a bigger scale and, and farming solely melons? Uh, so, like I said before, the, the biggest issue is labor. Yeah. It, it requires a lot of attention to detail, which becomes hard at, at a large scale. It, it, it is hard to do that, uh, especially when you try to mix in other crops that you're growing, cotton, corn, soybeans, yeah. uh, just like we are. But that that is the biggest thing is taking the time, coming out here. It, it's a very delicate crop. So it, it requires a lot of attention. You kind of have to be on top of your game rather than being behind the eight ball. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's been our biggest uh, hurdle, that, but we try every year to be a little bit better and a little more efficient. Do you um, have to come in and, and do any like spraying? Are, are you constantly looking for bugs or um, does that not affect our amounts as much? Yeah, so being close to a cotton field, the bugs come from over there. After a farmer sprays those, the, the pests have to find somewhere else to go. They like, just like any other flower, they will come over here and try to invade here uh, and get on these plants. So what we have to do is we kind of have to combat it ourselves and come in and spray every once in a while. We'll spray for bugs. Uh, the biggest thing we spray for is diseases. Though. Yeah. Uh, fungal diseases, viral diseases. We spend a lot of time out here looking, looking at plants, looking at the, at the leaves, looking at the fruit itself, making sure there, it, there isn't any virus or diseases out here because if so, they spread like crazy. Yeah. Do you have any issues with um, pests that aren't are, are bugs, maybe cocoons, deer? Yeah, we have our fair share of raccoons, coyotes, rabbits, anything that likes to munch on leaves and fruit Enjoying that they them. they get out here and they have a good time uh, the crazy thing is though we we use those as kind of telltale signs for us whether a crop is ready to be harvested so I'll at the beginning of the year I'll whenever I see melons coming out here uh, and forming I'll look and wait until I see coyote marks mm. because that that's always been a, a whole wives tale that whenever a coyote mark is on a watermelon that means it's the sweetest one out there and it's ready to eat so that's how we kind of that's one of the ways we determine whether a crop is ready to be harvested so you, you talked about you're a first generation farmer and and I'm, I'm sure that comes with its own obstacles um can you kind of tell us uh, what made you so interested in, in farming and and how being a first generation has really been for you yeah so the like i said the the way I got into it was I, I came out here whenever I was 12 or 13 and started pitching watermelons and cantaloupes for my my then my girlfriend's dad but yeah. now my father-in-law and uh, I've been out here every summer since and I'm this would be my 15th year out here handling watermelons every year it, I love it more and more and just recently I decided to start you know kind of doing this on my own and it, it does come with challenges because 
you know, you, you weren't born into it. Yeah. It, that, that's one of the big things, but uh, th there's a ton of resources and a ton of help out here along the way. And without them, I wouldn't be able to do what I do. And so I'm extremely thankful. Good. So, um, you know, kids and, and consumers obviously love enjoying a good watermelon, especially right. on a hot summer day. But um, what is something that you wish consumers knew uh, about agriculture, about farming, or about watermelon farming? Uh, just it, it's nice to be appreciated uh n not just me as the farmer myself but you know we've got people harvesting back here behind us mm -hmm. and th just to know how much labor how much how much goes into getting a crop in the ground and getting it to your local market where you buy it is uh it, it's not just oh it's Let's go out here and have fun. It, it's not all fun and games. But there's a lot of hard work that goes into it. So, you know, here in this field, I can see a few watermelons. Um, has this field been picked? And uh, kind of what happens to these that are, are left or not as mature when picking happens? Yeah, so right here where we're standing, they've already came through and picked this, obviously. Uh, there's not that much fruit out here. But uh, the good thing is, we come back through this field again we'll we'll make several pickings is what we call it uh, we'll, we'll pick this field several times in fact this is the fifth time we've we've been through this field that's the good thing about a watermelon plant when the first crop comes off it's it's not just a one a one-time deal mm -hmm. we make several attempts at coming out here and, and getting what fruit is ripe out here what's what's not we leave out here and, and let it ripen up so uh, when you when you come through here and, and you're picking and things, how time consuming like does it take? Uh, how much time would it take per acre? So this 40 acre field, it's gonna take pretty much all day to pick it. That's that's just typically how it goes. It's been about all day. Just yeah. And there's there's two different crews out here. There's there's one crew called the cutter and one crew called the pickers, or the loaders, pickers, loaders, yep. uh, interchangeable there. But So what the cutters do is they come through here first, they come early in the morning, they see which crop or which fruit is ripe. What the, all, they are, all they're doing is taking a knife and cutting it off the vine, making it a lot easier on the loaders to come through. And just it's just an efficiency thing. And, and that's the one of the things we battle with this time. Right. <laughs> so how, how do you know when a watermelon is ripe? If, if you're in the grocery store or if there are pickers coming through, how do they know it's ripe? Okay, so in the field, the way we determine that is if, if you roll it over on its belly, there's a, a, a lighter, mm -hmm. that's a yellow belly. Before it's ripe, it's actually a white belly. And so the, that's one of the first things we look for. Uh, so we'll roll it over, check the belly. If that's yellow, then what we do is we look for this little curly stem right here mm -hmm. and see how that's dead. Yeah. Uh, so whenever a watermelon is ripe and the plant's not putting any more nutrients or water into this plant, this will die off. Basically as a channel. Yep. It's kind of like a water faucet. It, it, this is the faucet and it's turning it off. Okay. And so when this is dead, then we know we can go ahead, cut it off, and get ready to put it on the bus and get it And so from there whenever we go to say the store yep what we're looking for is a couple of different it's, it's a sound thing mm -hmm. uh, so whenever you're you're patting it you hear the vibration yep that means the heart is intact and there is plenty of water in here there's not too much water uh, but whenever you come in to a store and you you hit it and it kind of sounds like just a like a thud yeah like, like a dead sound that means the heart is not intact any longer and it's typically overripe or past maturity. So the size has nothing to do with the maturity? Uh, not once it's in the grocery store. Okay. Uh, and, and even out here, you know, you'll have some that are, are this big and they're ready to pick. Right. Uh, it, it's all weather dependent out here in the field. So um, I was always told that the darker watermelons are the ripest is that or the sweetest is that uh, a wife's tale 
Uh, yeah, basically, because anymore there's so many different kinds of watermelons. Yeah. Like the one I just had, it's 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 a lighter colored melon, and but the inside of it is dark red. Whereas opposed to some of these out here that we've planted, the the darker melons are actually pinker on the inside, but they're they're all still ripe. Uh, so originally you had said that um, the seedless watermelons are infertile. Yes. And they have to be um, with the seeded watermelons. Is is seedless watermelons considered a GMO crop? They're actually not. Right. It, it, it's not. We're not messing with the DNA of the plant itself. Mm -hmm. It's just a. It, it was basically a hybrid that was created, and from there that they they kind of branched that off. But it is not a GMO crop. So watermelons, period, are, are not a GMO crop. No, it's all. It's what's called a conventional crop. There, there is no. They haven't bred it to where we can spray a certain kind of, kind of chemical on it or anything like that. Perfect.